Live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetWorksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you? Friday, July 15th, 2016. How are you at NetRich Nation? I hope you are enjoying yourself if that's the case. I know it's 8 a.m. for you. Good morning. Hope things are going okay. Uh, tough day. Not sure how to react to the morning, of course. Uh, bad news again, hanging over our heads. And... Uh, Gonna have to figure out how to deal with that situation. It is not a domestic situation this time, but of course, reaction to the attacks in Nice and uh, <clears throat> puts a cloud over everything. But uh, also putting a cloud over everything, Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party for uh, President of the United States, which is pretty sad. And Newt Gingrich still not convinced that he's not going to be named. His vice presidential candidate continues to uh, audition for the role, this time by insisting that the events in Nice mean that we here in the United States ought to throw the Constitution out. Basically, uh, a test, I I don't even know how he put it, Uh, but thank God he's going to do a lengthy Facebook Live appearance tonight. Uh, Appearance. Like, he's going on his own Facebook page to say, uh... What I meant was something totally constitutional. I'm going to test everyone in the country somehow to see if they believe in Sharia. Nice buzzword. And if they do, then we'll throw them out of the country. No word on whether or not anybody's going to test anyone for their belief or interest in Shabu Shabu, his highly elitist East Coast effete uh, favorite meal that he loves to eat at uh, his favorite restaurants in the very Tony McLean, Virginia, because he's a man of the people, et cetera, et cetera. I love when he tweets about how delicious McDonald's fries are. Every once in a while, he gets called out for his elitism. Mmm, great coffee, great fries. What a grandpa. <laughs> fries and coffee. Oh, my God. Anyway, uh, we hate that guy, and uh, we don't have to spend that much more time on him. The Trump train wreck continues, of course. <clears throat> uh It is, as someone points out today, 72 or so hours now, and I guess a little bit less, until the beginning of the Republican convention, and still we have no word about who's actually going to speak. Yesterday, of course, we covered the news that Jack Nicklaus says, uh, I don't know where you heard these rumors about me speaking, but I have no intention of doing that. Bobby Knight, though... Definitely coming, right? No, no. Don't know where you heard that either. I No way in hell I was going to do that. But don't worry. We still have Tim Tebow coming. And somebody else, too, who I can't even remember who it is. And uh, Tim Tebow took the opportunity last night to say, Nah, I'm just like those other guys. I, I'm not coming. Although I guess his denial was a little less or a little more equivocal rather than saying a little less unequivocal. We'll simplify things so that the coding runs faster. And... uh yeah, he, uh, he he didn't say, no, I'm definitely not going, but he said, that, that was a rumor. I don't know how these rumors get started, but they, you know, they sure travel fast. But no, no one has asked me about that. Now it's sort of morphed into a, he's not going. I don't know whether, there was one theory was that uh, he gave them a maybe and they took that as a hard yes. And then he saw how much flack he was getting and backed out. I don't know. I, I My other theory is Donald Trump is inviting The people he thinks will bring star power, in his mind, under that hairdo, uh, he thinks will bring star power to the television production of the convention. And he thinks, I'm Donald Trump. I've got a Rolodex. I can call people in. And, And I think it's based on having perhaps done charity events or something of the sort with these other guys where... I'm famous, you're famous, Um, I use my fame, I call you, I get through to you because I'm famous, I ask you to do this thing with me, you do because it's charity, and you know, Donald Trump, famous guy, no harm can be done doing a charity event with another famous guy, 
totally different kind of phone call. I'm running for president. Will you come to the convention and speak on my behalf at the convention? And most people don't want anything to do with that. But Trump, because he confuses everything in life that he controls with being his personality, right? His blurring the lines intentionally between his charitable foundation, his businesses, and his personality. Uh, he's making the same mistake, I think, with the celebrities who have done him favors and appeared in places when he's asked them to appear before and doesn't realize that they're going to react differently to being asked to come and back his bid for president at a nationally televised uh, convention for one of the two major political parties. That's poison to most celebrities who aren't famous for being politically involved in one way or another. And, uh, well, it continues. So now Tim Tebow is out. I don't know who else is going to be out, but like, like I saw it tweeted this morning, Matt McDermott tweeting this one, a uh, pollster and senior analyst at Whitman Insight Strategies, just by way of giving you the bio that goes along with things. Matt says, we're 72 hours from the start of the GOP convention and still without a convention schedule, which, by the way, was promised nine days ago, and without a VP pick, at least formally speaking, the other uh, flaming garbage fire of the morning for the Trump campaign. So nobody knows who's going to speak. Everybody that the Trump campaign and Trump himself said was going to come is now saying, no, I have no interest whatsoever. I don't know what you're talking about. In other words, you pulled that out of your ass and you're full of it. I mean, to put a finer point on things, which is ironic because I'm being more blunt, but anyway... Uh, the point is, everything he has promised has fallen through. And by the way, does anybody know if he ever actually filed the paperwork to forgive the loans to his campaign? Because he tweeted a couple of weeks ago that that was a done deal. Those were his words, done deal. But hold that up next to, yeah, Jack Nicholas is coming. No, he's not. Uh, Bobby Knight is coming. No, he's not. Tim Tebow is coming. No, he's not. I'm a billionaire. No, you're not. I have a plan. No, you don't. It's called management, ladies and gentlemen. I had to tweet that one out to remember that when he said that one during the debates. How are you going to do all this stuff? It's called management. It's called management. 72 hours to go. No speakers list. Don't know who the vice president is going to be. And that's not a big deal. You can keep that under your hat for a while. But that, I said, is also on fire. Yesterday, it looked like it was going to be Mike Pence. But who cares? Because Mike Pence, so bland, so vanilla. Now this morning's rumors are that uh, Trump is privately seething that the Pence news leaked before he was ready to leak it. And now everybody's like speculating that uh, he'll he'll dump Pence and go with somebody else, uh, you know, Chris Christie or something like that. Uh, Newt Gingrich, of course, still thinks he's in the running. Who knows whether any of this is true? Another theory was that uh, in addition to being pissed that Pence leaked the news, or at least he believes he leaked the news, and that's all that really matters in Donald Trump world, and that's one of the huge problems with making the guy president. doesn't matter whether it's really true. It's just he, he believes that, and so act based on that. So anyway, uh, one, he hasn't made his announcement. Two, he, he then postponed the announcement um, – because of the news from Nice, which I didn't think was such a terrible decision, although he's really actually getting a lot of flack for it, largely because he's he's like, well, I, I don't think it's time to engage in politics right now, which would be a totally understandable thing to do, kind of. I mean, given that there was a major attack, right? But then he calls into Fox News twice, I think, during the period in which he's supposed to not be engaging in politics. So he's full of it. He hasn't made up his mind. He's indecisive. He's a weirdo. He's impulsive. Paul Manafort already saying that that was an emotional decision for him, which, you know, you can make all kinds of comments about, as I did this morning. But basically, he's just a big man baby running around with no idea what to do. It's called management. What a jackass. Anyway, the, uh, the real truth is that he doesn't know what he's doing, and it's becoming quite apparent. It's I keep coming back to that. It's called management. That's so outrageous. It's crazy. Anyway, let's see. Uh, right. So one of the other theories that was floated the other day was 
that uh, the other day, yesterday, last night, uh, was that he was uh, he was mad with Pence, and he might either have been planning to do this from the beginning, or he now has additional reason to do it because he thinks Pence leaked the news. Pence originally uh, endorsed Ted Cruz, Lion Ted, who, by the way, might have to hand over the title at this point. Jack Nicklaus, Bobby Knight, Tim Tebow. Yeah, right. Okay. Lion who? No? Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the, the theory was he's still pissed at Pence for having endorsed Cruz, and this was all a setup to make him look like he was going to get the nomination and then leave him hanging at the last minute, abandon him, uh, leave him, jilt him at the altar, if you will, and uh, punish him for his Cruz support earlier. I don't know whether that's in the works, but it sure would be amazing. That guy should be president. Wow. Anyway, uh, here's some breaking news for you. Is our opportunity today to do the breaking news thing. You know, I'm constantly uh, bragging slash lying on the air about how get, uh, listening to Daily Coast Radio is like getting the newspaper a day early, or we break news, we tell you the news before it becomes news, you know, all of which is, of course, a lie and nonsense, I am willing to admit, because usually I am reading you a newspaper report of the news that I share with you, and so it is definitionally impossible for me to be telling you the news before it becomes news, but I just like to say it. The real, the real why it feels that way is uh, we pick up on news early, true, before the, the news cycle works fully for everybody and uh, distribute it to you via the radio and discuss it rather extensively uh, before anybody else has a chance to repeat that news, which is essentially how the, the news cycle really works. And so you uh, hear it from us on the radio and then you go out in the wide world and you see it in the papers and say, huh, I did hear about this. Or you hear people talking about it on the radio. Wow, I already heard about this. I'm so in the know. Well, okay, it's a trick. It's a mind game. But all right, that's what we do. Well, here I have news that I actually did break before it became news, except the lie part of this one is it didn't really actually become news. It happened. It's a fact. It really did come true. Uh, it's just not news. And the news is this. I don't have any news for you today. Why don't I have any news for you today? Because Greg Dworkin isn't going to be here. Why isn't Greg Dworkin going to be here? Because it's Friday and he has meetings. Why is that news? Isn't that usually the case? Yes, but yesterday, of course, we were on the air and Greg gave his usual sign off uh, and said, uh, well, we'll talk about more tomorrow. And I said, but isn't it Friday? Don't you have meetings? Oh, not tomorrow. Well, in between that and, of course, uh, this morning show, we get the uh, message, guess what? I've got meetings and I can't make the show tomorrow. So there you have it. News before it became news. I told you that Greg wasn't going to be here because meetings. Greg said, no, I'll be there. But he's not here. I don't know if I blame him for that necessarily. This is his job, after all. And, oh, I'm healing sick children. La, la, la. You know how these things go. Anyway, big deal. Asthma. Okay, fine. So it can kill you. And uh, it's better to keep it under control and to meet with other doctors and talk about how you're keeping it under control or whatever, like uh, operations of the uh, the practice at the hospital. That's fine. We understand these things. We've got plenty to talk about. Lots to fill in besides how terrible Donald Trump is. Although, it, I swear, this is really the worst I've ever seen. And... Uh, Newt Gingrich is disgusting. I think I'm done with that. Let's see. Parlio has a comment. Uh, TFW, that, uh, that cool internet lingo. Trump invites you to speak at the convention and your celebrity success depends on not alienate half the country, <laughs> alienating half the country. That's exactly what's going on with his celebrity pals who aren't really his friends. And that's, that's probably the rudest awakening he's had yet. Just like, the Trump Foundation money, if you give it to other, uh, if you use it to buy Tim Tebow helmets, that's not really giving to charity. That's self-dealing and self-enrichment and wrong. And if you invite somebody to do a charity event with you and they agree to do it and they're cordial with you, that doesn't necessarily mean they're your friend. I know it's probably very difficult for a rich person who is rich because personal brand, it's difficult to understand this thing. I mean, even his own life 
is all based on the same intermingling. He's rich to the extent that he is rich, to the extent that he has command of any cash. It's because he's built this personal brand in which it's all about him being a success and on and on. Of course, that whole shtick depends on him going on television and just saying he's a success, even if he isn't. I don't feel like I'm explaining anything new to you. So I'll move on from there. Um, by way of catching up with the actual serious news, Laura Clausen has done us the service of summarizing things on the front page. The death toll in the Nice truck attack sigh, reaches at least 84. And, uh, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I'll just read through the, the piece here. The apparent terrorist attack, and we're still in that stage. In Nice, in which a truck plowed through a crowd of people celebrating Bastille Day, and I neglected to wish everyone a happy Bastille Day yesterday, but I guess it was too late and it wasn't all that happy anyway, and yet I feel like I should have done it, uh, has killed at least 84 people, according to reports. The driver also shot a gun into crowds for good measure, just so you don't think it's all about the motor vehicle. Information is still emerging, but at this time we are aware of and can confirm two U.S. citizens were killed in the attack in Nice. Uh, we express our sincere condolences to the families and friends of those killed. State Department spokesman John Kirby said in a statement Friday, we are providing all possible consular assistance. Out of respect for the privacy of those involved, we have no further comment at this time. Our embassy in Paris is making every effort to account for the welfare of U.S. citizens in Nice. Any U.S. citizens in Nice should contact friends and family directly to inform them of their well-being. According to several reports, the two killed in the attack are, uh, so much for their privacy, Sean Copeland and his 11-year-old son, Brody, from Lakeway, Texas, near Austin. No break for Texas in this one. President Obama described it as appearing to be a horrific terrorist attack, and President French President Francois Hollande called for three days of mourning. He said that the day is a symbol of liberty and that human rights are denied by fanatics, and France is quite clearly their target. It is not yet clear if the attacker acted alone or was affiliated with a terrorist group. And uh, New York Times, I believe, is out with a graphic of some kind, which I didn't actually get the chance to take a look at, but uh, I guess illustrating how you know how long this truck driver was able to go on doing this before he was finally killed. And I guess that makes a certain amount of sense when you think about it. I mean, driving a truck through a crowd, there's not that much that's going to stop you if you're nuts. So, unbelievable news on that front, no doubt. Uh, let me uh, find a way to shift gears today. I mean, again, you, you terrorists are making things very difficult for me. You, you must understand this. But I refuse to give up. i got to shift topics because there's just not that much more that I can add to, to that. I mean... It is what it is, and we'll have to wait and see what sorts of connections they make to any terrorist groups based on their investigation uh, of this uh, of the perpetrator going forward. All right. Uh, is there more? I mean, there's a, our abbreviated pundit roundup, of course. We could depend on that for a grounding in news. Greg did provide that, as usual. And the uh, title reads, Veep Steaks. Served with mushrooms and onions. Mmm, delicious. Uh, Clinton, of course, turns out to be leading Trump in four battleground states, including the battleground states that the Q poll said she was not leading in yesterday. Uh, Florida comes immediately to mind. But the four in today's poll, uh, NBC News, Wall Street Journal, Maris polls. Colorado. Healthy lead there. Uh, well, all places. Colorado, Florida, North Carolina, Virginia. Those are the key battleground states listed. There is a Clinton lead in almost, well, in every single one of them. Uh, looks to be in the neighborhood of 44% for Clinton across all four states. Just slightly less than that in Colorado. With Trump coming in closer to the 33% mark. In the, those states, uh, oh, looks like, well, let's say, I, I don't have the actual, uh, are the numbers in here digitally or rather than being in graphic form here? I'm going off of the graph. 
Looks like about 43-34 in Colorado. 44-34-35, let's say, Florida. 44-35 North Carolina. And 44-34 in Virginia. That sucks for Trump. Great for the rest of the world. Too soon... Of course, for all the facts about France, as Greg puts it in the morning roundup here, uh, there'll be more on that tomorrow, undoubtedly. And it's just really not much chance to digest this thing among the punditry just yet. Uh, As for domestic politics, Greg tells us, Count on Trump and his allies to make things worse with calls for war and tests on U.S. Muslims that make terrorists rub their hands with satisfaction. Guaranteed some hot take will be how it will help Trump when the opposite has been true for other tragedies. It's a pundit reflex. They can't help themselves. You know how it is for John McCain, of course. Uh, Let's see. NBC Nightly News with their tweet, Donald Trump has not made a final, 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 final decision on who will be his vice presidential running mate. Uh, The above tweet was well after the campaign leaked Governor Mike Pence's name. We'll find out today. Strike through. We won't find out today because Trump postponed the announcement. But what a mess. He postpones every announcement, too, right? Uh, Has he, like I said, he hasn't produced the paperwork about forgiving the loans yet. Uh, How long did it take him to get around to proving that the money had gone to the vets groups? Because it hadn't. Habitual with this guy. Anyway, let's see. Uh, While I try and eat my breakfast and drink my coffee without the presence of Greg... (laughs) to cover for that today. Hmm. Summer schedule. Okay. On the Pence front, was it leaked by a stop Pencer? There are such people. I was discussing this at home yesterday. Uh, it's interesting uh, uh, that uh, I think the, the conventional wisdom on Pence among rank-and-file regular Republicans was that this was a good choice because he's a regular Republican, which we should point out means he's horrible, of course, on most of the issues that count for progressives, he's a hundred percent polar opposite of where we would can i mean you know there was no chance that you were going to think better of Trump because of his vice presidential pick, but rank and file evangelical type conservative Republicans were supposed to like him um But the Trump base is a weird place. There is certainly a part of the Trump base that will just accept whatever Mr. Trump says, and he'll have no problem there, even if Pence isn't particularly exciting. Mr. Trump says it, so I'm with it. But then there are also the alt-writers who I'm sure believe Pence to be a beta and a cuck, for that matter. So uh, I'm sure they're unhappy. I noticed, I, I noticed... Because you can't help it, because she shoves it in your face. That's what she does for a living. And Coulter was upset about it, but who cares? I mean, she doesn't really. I, in, in Trump world, she makes less and less difference. The one good thing about Donald Trump is it. there's no point in worrying about what Ann Coulter has to say about anything, because Donald Trump will be 100 times worse. In that sense, it would be great if Trump world absorbed all the oxygen and suffocated uh, Ann Coulter. Finally, let's see. Nothing but nothing says tiny but steady hand, (laughs) Craig says, like a smooth VP rollout, even before what happened in France. Alex Seitzwald tweeting, glad Trump didn't build his image around being a good being good at selecting people for jobs, because otherwise this waffling would be embarrassing. And it is. So to continue down this path. Uh, let's see, MSNBC and CNN are on the French Prime Minister presser. Fox is hosting Peter King calling for surveillance, of course, because what else in the world would uh, Peter King bother calling for? Surveillance, of course, of all Muslims. That according to Andrew Lawrence. And let's see what else we can find here. New battleground polls this morning from a NBC Marist. Okay, now the actual numbers. You can see how well I did at reading the graph. Uh, just by way of checking up on things, Colorado was indeed 43.35, a combined 21% saying neither, other, or undecided. Florida, you remember how they decided their 2000 presidential election, sort of. Clinton up 7 points, 44.37. 
North Carolina, uh, a state Obama won in 2008 but lost in 2012. Clinton leads by six points, 44-38. So I did ter- well. Either I did a terrible job reading the graph, or to be honest, the graph isn't that good. Anyway, in Virginia, Clinton's advantage is 9 points, not 10, 44, 35. That is a crappy graph. I'm just going to put that out there for you graph makers. With 66 electoral votes at stake in these four states, Donald Trump is playing catch-up against Hillary Clinton, says Lee Mirangoff, director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion, who should fire his graph maker. If, if that's where it happened. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Anyway... Uh, another tweet to wrap things up. Liam Donovan saying, NBC Marist is just brutal for Trump. Tops out in the high 30s in must-win states. Hmm. He has a ceiling? I had no idea. All right. NPR. What do they have to say? For their parts, political scientists Kopko and Devine. Really? Uh, they only find one election where the vice presidential pick would have mattered geographically. Geographically, interesting. And that was 2000. It came down to New Hampshire in our analysis, Copco said, pointing out that Al Gore had considered then-New Hampshire Governor Gene Shaheen for his vice presidential nominee, and that was the only Republican state in New England in the 2000 election. So, had Gore carried New Hampshire, which is really had Gore named Gene Shaheen and had naming Gene Shaheen helped carry New Hampshire. We can't be sure, but okay. Had that happened, well, he would have had a majority in the Electoral College and Florida would have been irrelevant. And that would be great. Florida should be irrelevant. Let's see. What else have we got here? Uh, hmm. A tweet from, I guess, inside Indiana speculating that maybe the Pence must go signs all over their state. Uh, maybe Trump thought that must me- must have meant he must go to D.C. <laughs> that from, uh, let's see, L. Cohen, uh, L.R.C. Indy underscore MSW. You can find it, of course, in Greg's morning roundup. If you're super interested in finding out how can I find out what else L. Cohen has to say about Pence, you may be. That one was good. BuzzFeed. How about this on Mike Pence? BuzzFeed, of course, uh, does little else better, let's say, than digging up buried quotes from the past from suddenly prominent politicians in ways that are calculated to be embarrassing. They're pretty good at that. Andrew Kaczynski, I think, the master of finding those things on video. Anyway, Mike Pence was in the target this time in the crosshairs. Here's what they came up with. Smoking doesn't kill. Another great old op-eds from Mike Pence, who I guess will write anything if you pay him enough. The Indiana governor, who is at the center of the debate surrounding the recently signed Religious Freedom Restoration Act, don't forget how badly he botched that, in his state, wrote something interesting, wrote some interesting op-eds 15 years ago. One, smoking doesn't kill. Uh, no proof. The evidence is still out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Josh Barrow found some great interest in those. He also tweeted, The rap on Pence is that he's not very smart and spits back whatever talking points he gets from lobbyists he's aligned with. Smoking doesn't kill would certainly appear to qualify. He doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence in his intelligence. Just, just looking at him. I am judging a book by its cover, but I, to be fair, the cover says this book is about morons. So, I mean, you're either lying or I'm entitled. After the LGBT debacle in Indiana, it's easy to believe he's a dim bulb. That's what Greg says, and I'm with him on that one. This time illustrated with a tweet from Joe Strupp. What Indiana journalists want you to know about Mike Pence. This, according to Media Matters. This is Media Matters' interpretation of what Indiana journalists want you to know about Mike Pence. Wow. Uh, that's a lot of stages in that. Uh, maybe we'll even take a look at that just for fun. Put that aside for later, because uh, knowing about Mike Pence might be of interest. Although, again, Donald Trump is so much more interesting to know things about, because there's such dumb things. Think Progress has an entry in this category. How Mike Pence's arrogance handed the Christian right a staggering defeat. Yay! The Indy Star reports that Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump, you know that guy, 
Plans to name Indiana Governor Mike Pence. You don't know that guy. A man who once described himself as, quote, a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. That doesn't really hurt him with his people. Anyway, and uh, he's supposed to be, okay, so he, he's up for a VP, as you know. So, well, you would expect religious conservatives to be over the moon. They aren't, because the moon is pagan. Todd Starnes writes that uh, Family Research Council's Tony Perkins says he will not support Pence as VP. Although, does that even mean anything? I won't support Mike Pence as VP. Yes, you will. You'll vote Republican. The end. You won't be happy about it? Oh, pff, who cares? Are you going to cast the ballot? That's what I want to know. And then, uh, who are we reading here? Oh, this is the Think Progress piece. And then, just days after he signed the original legislation, Pence caved. That would be the... Uh, uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act state bill. The fix Pence signed did not completely neuter the state's RFRA law, but it did provide that the law does not authorize businesses to refuse to offer to provide services, facilities, use of public accommodations, goods, employment, or housing to any member or members of the general public on the basis of a list of protected traits that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. It was a staggering defeat for social conservatives who were struggling to gain a beachhead against the growing recognition that LGBT people are human beings entitled to the same civil rights as anyone else. Indiana is a red state. Pence is an extraordinarily conservative governor. Indeed, as a member of Congress, Pence led the Republican Study Committee, a large group of conservative lawmakers whose leaders functioned as a spokesperson for the House of Representatives right wing during much of Pence's tenure in the House. And I guess those guys uh, now overtaken by events and the House Freedom Caucus. Hmm. So thanks, uh, thanks a bunch there with that one. Uh, let's see, what else is up next? Oh, well, here's a, uh, a, a another angle on Indiana. Infectious diseases, which that's not a great uh, name to have to go by, but, you know, what can you do? That's that's the line of work here. That's tw- the Twitter name, uh, who tweets, I have an infectious disease. Stay away from me. Don't let, don't re- you just got it by reading this tweet. And also tweets, a lesson learned in Indiana, cut back on HIV prevention and find yourself with an expensive HIV outbreak. I was linking to a story on the Huffington Post about that one. Indiana shut down its rural planned parenthood clinics and ended up with an HIV breakout because, of course, Planned Parenthood does so much more than those nasty, nasty things which conservatives like to accuse them of, uh, but which constitute a minuscule at this point uh, part of the actual spectrum of services they provide but uh, it should be kept in mind that Pence is probably uh, uh, one of the earliest of the Republican leaders to uh, uh, to to lead the charge against Planned Parenthood to target Planned Parenthood constantly for everything so to the extent that that bothers you you won't like Mike Pence very much though I believe you are already convinced on that front. Washington Post has a headline here, or at least a, uh, a quote from out of one of their articles. Uh, so, Mike Pence has been a huge supporter of the thing Donald Trump says is terrible for America. What is that thing? Free trade. Pence was told to be a free trader, so he was. And that's the dominant theme. He does what he's told to do. Perfect VP, at least for Donald Trump, Alexander uh, Petri tweeting, Mike Pence is what happens when you forget to put a comma in the sentence, Trump needs someone with experience in governing badly. Whoops. Well, we put the comma in there as a pause, but you know uh, how that will work out. Maybe it's best in writing. A reminder of why not Chris Christie from WNYC. Let's see. Probably a lot of the stuff we discussed yesterday, right? One of the New Jersey... One of New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's closest friends and longtime mentors pleaded guilty in federal court Thursday in connection with a sprawling scandal that has engulfed the Christie administration. Another one. David Samson from the other one, the original one, uh, 76, in case you were wondering, how old is David Samson? Do I need to send him a card? Christie's former appointee as chairman of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey was charged with one felony count of bribery for demanding 
Remember this one? United Airlines executives create a special flight route to his vacation home in exchange for favorable treatment from the agency, which operates Newark Liberty International Airport, uh, a.k.a. Newark Airport to everyone else in the world. Okay, uh, story from the AP. On, this, on the eve of the summer's political conventions at which the general election campaign officially begins, the latest AP GFK findings underscore a deep sense of unease that is sharpening the political divide in America and shaping an already nasty race for president. So much so, so much so, that notable numbers of Americans even hold negative views about the candidate they want to win. <laughs> Man, I'll just, all right, whatever. 14% of both, both Trump's and Clinton's supporters say they're backing a candidate they don't like. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Ronald Brownstein in the new Heartland poll. Hillary Clinton leads Donald Trump 11 to 1 among Obama approvers. He leads 10 to 1, uh, what, among disapprovers? Uh, okay. Wow. Uh, let's see, what other items have we here? CNN chiming in. Iran nuclear deal at anniversary. Not the rallying cry GOP saw it. It's not the. It's not Benghazi too, after all. Uh, and seeing as how Benghazi one sucked, we really were hoping for better. Uh, what do they have to say here? CNN. In the intervening months, the issue has largely dropped off the political agenda, while GOP presumptive nominee Donald Trump regularly rails against the deal on the campaign trail. He only spent two seconds on it, so that's one of the things that has kept it a hot issue for the Trump base. Is you just remind people of it. And you go, and the Iran deal, that sucks too. And everybody goes, yeah. But you don't have anything to say substantively about it. So you know, if you did, you would bore them and they would say, this isn't even an issue anymore. But if well, that's the, uh, the, the benefit of being about a centimeter deep on everything is you, all, all you can say about them is the applause lines. So I guess that actually kind of works. While uh, Trump regularly rails against the deal on the campaign trail, international challenges like global terror, China, China, and Russia have gotten more attention and had a greater impact on the political environment because he can rail more. He can say more talking points about them. Criticism of the deal has toned down quite a bit from the period of congressional review last summer, noted Robert Einhorn, a former State Department advisor involved in negotiating the deal. What else have we got? Jonathan Landay with this story. Donald Trump and kids named in $250 million tax scam. That in the Daily Beast. We'll click on that one. Hopefully no auto-playing video and put that aside. Maybe we'll just beat the crap out of Trump and uh, talk about some other gun history today just to round things out. Ryan Grimm. I was going to say, how much longer is, you know, we're just going to read the whole thing here. Because you can read it for yourself, it's true. But this does give us better ideas of things to talk about. And I'm not going to stop when I see Ryan Grimm's name come up. Top leaders from more or less every tech company you can think of. Google, Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, Slack, TaskRabbit. Oh, my God, that's still around. Flickr, Instacart, (laughs) and dozens more have organized an open letter condemning Donald Trump's candidacy for president, a remarkable intervention from an industry that is known to lean liberal but has been reluctant to engage aggressively with electoral politics. Uh, P.S., I think they uh, have all have executives that are sharing uh, sex slaves, but we'll get back to that some other day. The letter, which was published in the Huffington Post blog, uh, makes clear that the tech titans, 145 in total, are speaking in their personal capacity... They're, it's interesting that they would bother to make such a thing clear. Their personal capacity, and not for the companies they represent, but the message it sends is clear. Its core warning is that Trump's brand of xenophobia and nativism, far from making America great again, will in fact hamstring its innovative capacity and undermine its potential greatness. Some of the most successful technology companies, such as Google, have founders who are immigrants. Their native country's loss is America's gain. What else have we got? Adriana McIntyre reminding us, 650 pregnant women in the U.S. and territories with Zika. Congress about to go on recess until September. Shrug. Let's see. Hmm. Sip of coffee. Washington Post with a gun story. To reduce suicides, look at guns. 
Probably not a bad idea. Limiting gun access could cut the suicide suicide rate by over a third. Shane Goldmacher with uh, this tweet breaking. GOP convention, period. <laughs> it's really where we should stop that one. GOP convention organizers beg Sheldon Adelson to fill the $6 million shortfall. Uh, I didn't realize until yesterday that there was a $6 million shortfall, but uh, there is, and surely a billionaire who's being nominated would have something to say about plugging that hole, but I guess not. What a shocker. I am surprised. Okay, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to come up with the monies. Uh, Rice University, this is, oh, this is what we talked about yesterday. Can't be two interesting things in a row from Rice University. Is that possible? And sharing the robot story with all of the rest of you uh, who didn't, I don't know, where were you yesterday? Again, you would have, this is the sort of story that isn't necessarily widely reported, but if it were to filter down to you somehow, like, let's say, the abbreviated pundit roundup, you would say, oh, I heard about this story already. You would have heard about it from Greg, and Greg would have heard about it, of course, from Rice University, but it sounds like the k Girl in the Morning Show is giving you news before it becomes news. Oh, look, robots are also threatening the cornered killer with a gun jobs market, right? We know about that one, and the ongoing debate about what to do about, uh, or, or whether it's something to really worry about, delivering bombs via robot to kill cornered gunmen. It's got implications, to be sure. But I guess if the idea is uh, we have a cornered gunman who's behind cover that can hold out there for hours and can just shoot us while we try and work our way in to shoot him. And by the way, all we're really trying to do here, the only thing we're really going to be capable of doing is getting inches closer to launch some kind of either percussion grenade or chemical weapon of some kind into there to to deal with them um why not send a bomb if he's all alone you know i, I mean it's, it's uncomfortable because i guess you never really know why what you're sending anything into and uh that being the case you can't be 100 percent sure nobody else is in there with him a bomb might not be the idea but if you're going to just pelt him with gunfire you stand a pretty good chance of killing anybody who might be in there with him anyway uh there's uh there's pros and cons, to be sure. Uh, we'll want to examine the cons at some point, too. Let's see. What else here? Uh, Tyler Dukes with a tweet. Incredible work here by Atlanta Journal-Constitution Investigative, AJC Investigative, digging into doctors and sex abuse. My word. Cases found in every state. Doctors forgiven. A national investigation. Sex abuse. Tough issue. Uh, impactful. And because it involves sex, and in this case professionals, lots of desire to sweep things under the rug. Uh, we got some growing up to do on sex in general, but sex abuse in particular here in this country. Uh, but that's, that's, a, uh, that's as blanket a statement as I can make about the thing. Let's, let's move on to some of the other issues. Thank you, Greg, for rounding those up. Hope the meeting went well. And uh, let's take a look at the other fun things I have put aside. Let's see. There's lots of stuff about Trump, definitely. Uh, still more stuff about uh, Roger Ailes, which you really do need to get to. Hmm. Uh, let's, though, continue with a theme, the theme we began yesterday. I don't know how many of you got to the secret history of guns in this country that we didn't get a chance to discuss yesterday. That is to say, we didn't finish reading the articles, and, and maybe we ought to just do that, because may, maybe you've become dependent upon me reading the things to you, and uh, otherwise these things are too long, and you didn't read them. That's a possibility. Also, I didn't. So indulge me here so that I can uh, go on and, and fill in the rest of my background. Where do we leave off? I don't know. We're going to have to uh, scroll down. And take a look. We got into the Civil War things, uh, post-Civil War black codes. Uh, I also have an addition, by the way, to the storyline or the the um, the f fabric we're weaving about guns that comes from Bjorn, who just tweeted me on a completely different subject, but he sent me something about uh, 
post Civil War and uh, or I'm sorry pre Civil War secret history of guns that fits very neatly into these things. Uh, but he is instead tweeting me at the moment about would a robot be able to deliver a fairly instant sedative on fiction TV? It would. Yeah, there are certainly I don't know about a sedative or an instant, uh, but, but uh, certainly non lethal weaponry probably could have been delivered. For that, so I guess that's a that's definitely a an area for questioning, and certainly there are people who have speculated, you know, if it was a white guy, they would have done that, or or told them uh, lay down your gun and we'll give you some Burger King when we take you over to the station. That happens too. Uh, any number of things, I guess a robot can deliver anything, and if it doesn't work, so what? What do you lose a robot? And you probably lost it with the bomb. Uh, <clears throat> but clearly they were after some finality, and uh, I guess well. It, Adding to the to the complications in decision making always is when you're talking about how will cops deal with a cop killer, and the answer is badly. Uh, that is, there's not going to be an awful lot of uh, opportunity for live capture, or even if they do, uh, chances are you'll be mistreated once captured. Uh, they certainly had other options, although that's the easiest one to rig up. I mean, there's uh, all kinds of calculations and nuance involved in uh, dealing with uh, uh, less than lethal uh, weaponry, whereas an exploding bomb, if it works, kills them. Fantastic. If it doesn't work, maims them, and we can probably capture them. It's, it's a pretty good uh, CYA kind of a move. All right. So uh, anyway, back to the secret history of guns where we left off uh, was with, let's see, the uh, discussion of the impeachment of President Johnson, of course, and that one of the prosecutors at the impeachment trial was the representative from Ohio, John Bingham, who thought that the only way to protect freedmen's rights in the South was to amend the Constitution, right? And we had the 14th Amendment grow out of that. The key phrase being privileges or immunities of citizens, and that would include uh, the first eight and not the last two garbage amendments to the Constitution. And, uh, of course, among them, the right to keep and bear arms. So let's see. We kind of left off around here. The 14th Amendment illustrating a common dyna- dynamic in America's gun culture. Extremism stirs strong reactions. The aggressive Southern effort to disarm the freedmen prompted a constitutional amendment to better protect their rights. A hundred years later, the Black Panthers' brazen insistence on the right to bear arms led whites, including conservative Republicans, to support new gun control. Then the pendulum swung back. The gun control laws of the late 1960s, designed to restrict the use of guns by urban black leftist radicals, fueled the rise of the present-day gun rights movement. One that, in an ironic reversal, is predominantly white, rural, and politically conservative. Uh, by the way, note to myself here, where can I uh, scribble something? I got a point to make about uh, more about this, I guess, secret history or really where we're trying to – what I'm trying to extract from this is uh, black versus white when it comes to gun rights. I mean, that's where we started with all this, discussing uh, – the treatment of open carry protesters in general, the treatment of the open carry protesters in Dallas, uh, the treatment of Philandro Castile, uh, and, and on and on and on. But uh, yesterday's rant about Jamie Gilt actually comes into play here too, just by way of sideline here. Um, of course, you heard me lose it about the uh, the deal she had cut with the state attorney's office, which, by the way, about which, by the way, I should say, uh, there is some continuing confusion. The article we read yesterday said that although it was the Putnam County, Florida, sheriff's office responsible for recommending charges against her, and they totally undercharged her even in that. It was a, what, a second-degree misdemeanor allowing a minor access to weapons. That was the best they could come up with. Uh, and, uh, pro- I mean, they're right. That's probably the best that they've got on the books there. That's because Florida, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's part of a rigged system there, I guess, just to borrow a phrase. I mean, there's a reason why 
the best thing they've got on the books is that. It's because Florida is reluctant to prosecute people for anything having to do with screwing up with guns. Even though, No matter how badly you screw up, it's the guns that worry them. That is to say, protecting the guns. Anyway, uh, it occurred to me that this is another branch of the same sort of rigging of the system, black versus white, when it comes to gun rights. Uh, and it's this. I mean, aside from... Oh, uh, I don't even know which direction to go here. Aside from the fact that she was getting off lightly for this gun mistake, there is this other issue uh, that came to mind as I was thinking about, she's going to be licensed as an NRA instructor despite this giant screw-up, but whatever. But thinking about the whole thing, like she should never have had the guns in the first place because she's actually got a criminal record. Now... You might say, well, and you'd be right, down in Florida, they don't care about that stuff necessarily because it wasn't a felony on her record. But the thing she did is a felony. She just happened to get a bargain on that. too. She's a shoplifter. I mean, it's not crazy, outrageous, violent crime. And it may very well be the Florida statute prevents uh, uh, gun ownership by people convicted of violent felonies only. That wouldn't surprise me terribly. But uh, she's a shoplifter, a convicted shoplifter, and she bargained it down to a misdemeanor. So the misdemeanor didn't count against her right to own weapons, and so she did. But I guess this is what I meant to say in terms of the disparity between blacks, black and white justice, I guess. This is not always and universally going to be the case, but if you're white and you get caught shoplifting and black and caught shoplifting, there's a lot of difference in the outcome very often and it has very often something to do with access to money to pay for decent lawyers. If you got a public defender and you're black, a black shoplifting suspect, uh, the chances are a lot less. It's not that public defenders are no good. It's just that they're overwhelmed, but the chances of getting somebody who can hammer out a decent deal for you where you can plead to a misdemeanor and keep your right to, you know, own guns. I don't know if that was even on her mind at the time. But uh, even so, in the long term, it still ends up being a factor, right? Uh, The poorer defendant, and in many cases, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, a black defendant picked up, you know, on a shoplifting charge, uh, doesn't have the means to... Get a lawyer who can bargain things down if he even has an eye on these things. Just, But even just, I'd like to do less jail time. Everybody has an interest in that. But white folks, well, you know, through various other parts of the system that work the way they work, for whatever reason, sometimes have access to some extra, extra cash. And dad, if he's a gun enthusiast too, might even know offhand. You know what? We really have to get this bargain down to a misdemeanor for a number of reasons, not the least of which is I want you to learn to shoot and be able to own guns. And voila, for whatever reason, uh, it works out very well, generally speaking, for her uh, and enables her to own and improperly maintain control of the firearm, which later shot her in the back and nearly killed her, thanks to her four-year-old son, who she trained to be around guns, but then conveniently forgot to mention that in her speech, or whatever. Anyway, I found that very interesting. The other thing I found interesting, like I said, the confusion, charged by uh, the Putnam County, or uh, charges recommended by the Putnam County, Florida Sheriff's Office, but the article we read yesterday said that uh, they made a deal instead with the state attorney's office in Sanford for this second-degree misdemeanor charge to be dropped in exchange for her agreement to go to gun safety training, get a mounted holster for the car, fantastic, uh, certify that her guns were safely stored at home, and to give the 10 speeches, convincing people that they can have their children shoot them too, and it's okay, as we found out yesterday. So I was sort of, you know, annoyed by this, and said, I wonder if the state's attorney is aware of what she's actually teaching people. Now, it may very well be that the state's attorney is a gun nut, and not only either doesn't care what she says or is happy 
that she's actually out there saying such things. That's entirely possible. So I went to find out, is there anybody, uh, who is the state's attorney in this Sanford office that made this deal? And is there any way for us to get word to that person that this was a terrible deal and that we're watching and that they should revoke the deal and make her do 10 speeches that help instead of 10 speeches that hurt? Technically, though, she did say in the article that she'd already done her 10 speeches and this was a freebie, so maybe she did 10 good speeches and now she's going around for free doing terrible speeches. Maybe. It's a possibility. Or also, of course, uh, the uh, she might have given a fantastic speech and all the NRA instructors in attendance misinterpreted it to mean, hey, all that nonsense I've been saying about uh, no such thing as a gun accident is really stupid. There are gun accidents. They happen to people we like. Uh, it's negligence when it's people we don't like. And that was the underlying uh, outrage of the whole thing. Anyway, I went and looked it all up through the Google, and I found the state attorney's office in Sanford. And I said, well, th that must be it, right? There's only one state attorney's office in Sanford that I know of, that I was able to find. And that was in, uh, Florida does it this way. It's not by county necessarily. Uh, many states do, you know, state's attorney by county. And each county has their own state attorney. Florida, I don't know, too big, whatever. They do judicial districts, uh, circuits, state judicial circuits. And a state attorney represents a district, and that's a couple of counties. Sometimes I guess they probably split counties in half here and there. Anyway, uh, uh, Judicial Circuit 18 is the one that's got a state attorney's office in Sanford. And that office has a public information officer who's on Twitter. So I yelled at that person on Twitter. Hey, did you know that Jamie Gilt is out there giving speeches that actually make it worse? You should revoke this dumb deal. The answer came and said, well, you know, you should do some research before you tweet because that's not us. It's actually in the 7th Judicial District, not the 18th, which was, you know, uh, helpful, I guess, if true. And I'm not certain that it is. And I can understand they're being perturbed at having been called out if it's not really them. Um, no answer yet to my follow-up question is, do you know why all the news reports say that the deal was cut with the state attorney's office in Sanford? Because that is you, unless... Is there another Sanford in Florida? Is there a reason why the state attorney for the seventh judicial circuit would have a satellite office in Sanford? Can you tell me about any of this? No answer about that. Uh, the seventh judicial circuit's state attorney was not as reachable via Twitter, but, uh, just for the record, I mean, I guess if you're in Florida and you feel like making some trouble, um, I believe the guy's name was R.J. Larizza, um, L-A-R-I-Z-Z-A. Yes, he's the state attorney for District 7, and I did find, eventually, some news reports that actually named the state attorney who allegedly cut the deal. So I went back to the... I follow up for you people, you know? I do my work. Uh, I went back to the author, the uh, journalist who filed the story we read, also available on Twitter, and one of the best things about Twitter, and I asked, say, uh, do you happen to know, were you working off of previous articles and previous information about the deal having been cut with the office in Sanford? Because that's Judicial District 18, and they say they had nothing to do with it, that it was in Judicial District 7, which is the one that covers Putnam County. But there have been previous reports that said Sanford, and did you just maybe rely on those reports and pass that along, and it was a mistake that was made earlier and just got repeated? She said she'd check in on it and get back to me, uh, but that was late yesterday, and she had a big story brewing on uh, a, uh, a, a, a child pornography ring being busted up in Florida. Can you believe it? So she was a little bit distracted about that one. I don't know whether she'll ever get back to us on that one. But if she does, or even if she doesn't, I should probably approach her and say, do you think there's a story in this? Because the state attorney wanted her to make things better, and she's making things worse, according to your story. Of course, for all I know, she's a gun nut, too. Anyway, 
that was very much on my mind, and I wanted to get it off my mind so that I could free it up to go back to the secret history of guns. Seriously, I'm really going to do that. Okay, so yesterday um, we left off right around here. We're immediately post-war, 14th Amendment. We discussed the fact that the NRA has evolved from a gun regulate a body that was okay with gun regulation to maximalist anti-regulation today right uh that they originally founded in 1871 by george wingate and william church the latter a former reporter for the new york times first set out to improve america's soldiers marksmanship because they were disappointed in the north's performance in the civil war in the 1920s and 30s the nra was at the forefront of legislative efforts to enact gun control the organization's president at the time was Carl T. Frederick, a Princeton and Harvard educated lawyer known as the best shot in America, a title he earned by winning three gold medals in pistol shooting at the 1920 Summer Olympic Games. As a special consultant to the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, Frederick helped draft the Uniform Firearms Act, a model of state-level gun control legislation. Since the turn of the century, lawyers and public officials have increasingly Sought, had increasingly sought to standardize the patchwork of state laws. The new measure imposed more order and, in most cases, far more restrictions. By the way, side note, that is ended up being the model for ALEC in a perverted sort of way. Uniform state laws and uniform acts um, and the model law idea, though, came from originally... The concept was you bring together basically the leading lights and scholars and, and lawmakers of both sides and hammer out something that would be acceptable as a good government compromise by both sides in the legislature. Where Alec screwed with it was that they decided just to bring, what if we just bring together one side and call it a model law and everybody will think that means, oh, model laws. That's where they bring together both sides. Uh, and they were able to take advantage of things there. Plus, of course, now the new, uh, uh, the political atmosphere today being what it is, uh, one, polarized, and two, campaign in a box, and three, part-time state legislators, uh, it makes even more sense there where you can just say, if you want to be a national up-and-coming legislative star and run for Congress based on that, you can use our cheat sheets. Just say this is your legislation and you'll look like a legislative star instantly. Campaign in a box. Legislating in a box. All right. So where were we on this one? Um, so Frederick helped draft the Uniform Firearms Act. Um, there was the movement on to standardize the patchwork of state laws. Frederick's model law had three basic elements. The first required that no one carry a concealed handgun in public without a permit from the local police. A permit would only be granted to a suitable person with proper reason for carrying a firearm. And second, the law required gun dealers to report to law enforcement every sale of a handgun, in essence creating a registry of small arms. Finally, the law imposed a two-day waiting period on handgun sales. The NRA today condemns every one of these provisions as a burdensome and ineffective infringement on the right to bear arms. Frederick, however, said in 1934 that he did not believe in the general promiscuous toting of guns. I think it should be sharply restricted and only under licenses. The NRA's executive vice president at the time, Milton A. Reckford, told Congressional Committee that his organization was absolutely favorable to reasonable legislation. According to Frederick, the NRA sponsored the Uniform Firearms Act and promoted it nationwide. Highlighting the political strength of the NRA even back then, a 1932 Virginia Law Review article reported that laws requiring a license to carry a concealed weapon were already, quote, in effect in practically every jurisdiction. When Congress was considering the first significant federal gun law of the 20th century, the National Firearms Act of 1934, which imposed a steep tax and registration requirements on gangster guns like machine guns and sawed-off shotguns, the NRA endorsed the law. Carl Frederick and the NRA did not blindly support gun control. Indeed, they successfully pushed to have similar prohibitive taxes on handguns stripped from the final bill, arguing that people needed such weapons to protect their homes. 
Yet the organization stood firmly behind what Frederick called reasonable, sensible, and fair legislation. One thing conspicuously missing from Frederick's comments about gun control was the Second Amendment. When asked during his testimony on the National Firearms Act whether the proposed law violated any constitutional provision, he responded, I have not given it any study from that point of view. Amazing. In other words, the president of the NRA hadn't even considered whether the most far-reaching federal gun control legislation in history conflicted with the Second Amendment. Preserving the ability of law-abiding people to have guns, Frederick would write elsewhere, lies in an enlightened public sentiment and in intelligent legislative action. It is not to be found in the Constitution. That is rather amazing and pretty indicative of how universal the understanding at that time, and to be honest, I mean, I guess objectively you can only say that it's cons- it's a hundred years closer to the founders than we are, basically. Um, they were they were pretty clear on this. Yeah, the Second Amendment. Oh yeah. Oh, well, but that's about state militias. That, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. We're talking about, and of course, they thought that they were being expansive of gun rights. Well, there is some need for individual ownership of firearms for home protection, but the Second Amendment isn't where that lies. At least at that point, that's what they thought. Hmm. In the 1960s, the NRA once again supported the push for new federal gun laws. After the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, uh, it helpfully tells us by Lee Harvey Oswald, are you sure? Who had bought his gun through a mail-order ad in the NRA's American Rifleman magazine. <clears throat> Franklin Orth, then the NRA's executive vice president, actually was embarrassed by this, testified in favor of banning mail-order rifle sales. Name the law that would have prevented this. Uh, how about we ban mail-order rifle sales? Okay. It was a different time. We do not think that any sane American who calls himself an American can object to placing into this bill the instrument which killed the President of the United States. Orth and the NRA did not favor stricter proposals like national gun registration, but when the final version of the Gun Control Act was adopted in 1968, Orth stood behind the legislation. While certain features of the law, he said, appear unduly restrictive and unjustified in their application to law-abiding citizens, the measure as a whole appears to be one that the sportsmen of America can live with. Uh, The first cuck. A growing group of rank-and-file NRA members disagreed. In an era of rising crime rates, yikes, fewer people were buying guns for hunting and more were buying them for protection. The NRA leadership didn't fully grasp the importance of this shift. In 1976, Maxwell Rich, the executive vice president, announced that the NRA would sell its building in Washington, D.C., and relocate the quarters, headquarters to Colorado Springs, retreating from political lobbying and expanding its outdoor and environmental activities. Rich's plan sparked outrage among the new breed of staunch, hardline, alt-right, guns rights activists. The dissidents were led by a bald, blue-eyed bulldog of a man named Harlan Carter, who ran the NRA's recently reformed, uh, recently formed lobbying arm, the Institute for Legislative Action. In May 1977, Carter and his allies staged a coup at the annual membership meeting, elected the new executive vice president, Carter, would transform the NRA into a lobbying powerhouse committed to a more aggressive view of what the Second Amendment promises to citizens. The new NRA was not only responding to the wave of gun control laws enacted to disarm black radicals, it also shared some of the Panthers' views about firearms. Both groups valued guns primarily as a means of self-defense. Both thought people had a right to carry guns in public places, where a person was easily victimized and not just in the privacy of their own home. They also shared a profound mistrust of law enforcement. For years, the NRA had demonized government agents, like those in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and Explosives, the federal agency that enforces gun laws, as jackbooted government thugs Wayne LaPierre, the current executive vice president, warned members in 1995 that anyone who wears a badge has the government's go-ahead to harass, intimidate, and even murder law-abiding citizens. That is true, and when they do, you don't say anything. Because they're black. Or at least if they are. 
For both the Panthers in 1967 and the new NRA after 1977, law enforcement officers were too often representatives of an uncaring government bent on disarming ordinary citizens. A sign of the NRA's new determination to influence electoral politics was the 1980 decision to endorse for the first time in the organization's 100 years, though they're breaking all the norms, a presidential candidate. Their chosen candidate, none other than Ronald Reagan. So breaking all the norms is okay, because Reagan, who more than a decade earlier, had endorsed Don Mulford's law to disarm the Black Panthers, a law that had helped give Reagan's California one of the strictest gun control regimes in the nation. But they're just about the guns. Don't worry about it, right? It's all about guns. Sure. Reagan's views had changed considerably since then, and the NRA evidently had forgiven his previous support of vigorous gun control. In 2008, a landmark ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that the government cannot ever completely disarm the citizenry. That would be District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court uh, clearly held in that case for the first time that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual's right to possess a gun. Uh, let's see. Uh, by the way, update on Josh Warren's question from that I stated uh, on yesterday's show. John Ronald tweets us, Swords are classified as an illegal knife in Texas based on length and thus can't be carried in public. That's the answer on the knife laws. Uh, I thought as much. Okay. Gun rights groups. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I left off with the uh, D.C. versus Heller. The Supreme Court, for the first time, talks about an individual's right to pres- possess a gun. In an opinion by Justice Antonin Scalia, who's now dead, the court declared unconstitutional several provisions of the district's unusually strict gun control law, including its ban on handguns and its prohibition of the use of long guns for self-defense. Indeed, under D.C.'s law, you could own a shotgun, but you could not use it to defend yourself against a rapist climbing through your bedroom window. Uh, You'd have to know he was a rapist beforehand. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Gideon insists that, this, by the way, in the U.K., everyone carries a sword. And why not? Uh, In their their umbrellas, right? It's a cane sword. Uh, Also, everyone uh, carries... Well, everyone's a double O agent there, so they have license to kill. So it's all right. Gun rights groups trumpeted the ruling, Heller, as the crowning achievement of the modern gun rights movement and predicted certain victory in their war to end gun control. Their opponents criticized the court's opinion as right-wing judicial activism that would call into question most forms of gun control and lead inevitably to more violence and more or more victims of gun violence. So far, at least, neither side's predictions have come entirely true. I'll add entirely to that. The courts have been inundated with lawsuits challenging nearly every type of gun regulation. In the three years since the Supreme Court's decision, lower courts have issued, it was then three years, it's now more, issued more than 200 rulings on the constitutionality of gun control. In a disappointment to the gun rights community, nearly all laws have been upheld. The lower courts consistently point to one paragraph in particular from the Heller decision. Nothing in the opinion Scalia wrote should be taken to cast doubt on longstanding prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. This paragraph from the pen of Justice Scalia, the foremost proponent of constitutional originalism, was astounding. True, the founders imposed gun control, but they had no laws resembling Scalia's list of Second Amendment exceptions. They had no laws banning guns in sensitive places, or laws prohibiting the mentally ill from possessing guns, or laws requiring commercial gun dealers to be licensed. Such restrictions are the product of the 20th century. Justice Scalia, in other words, embraced A living constitution. Wow, surprise ending to this piece. In this, Heller is a fine reflection of the ironies and contradictions and the selective use of the past that run throughout America's long, and I guess till now secret, history with guns. So how's that by way of background? Very helpful, I thought, but there's more. Let's see. Uh, First, there is yet another Atlantic piece this time uh let's get to the original here david graham the second amendments second class citizens so now the atlantic taking a second pass at the uh issue i'm 
dancing around with these couple of pieces here. The last piece, of course, 2011. This one, uh, basically today, July 7th, 2016, uh, with, written with Philando Castile in mind. The Second Amendment's second class citizens. The shootings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile share several striking stomach churning similarities. They were black men killed by police in deeply segregated communities. Both killings captured on video, a product of an age in which anyone can tape an encounter with police, if they'll let you, and increasingly anyone, especially anyone black, realizes doing so may be important. But both Castile and Sterling also shared one other thing in common. Both men were apparently carrying guns when they were killed. According to Lavish Reynolds, Castile's girlfriend, who was in a car with him when he was shot, I've seen two different names for her, right? Uh, in the car with him when he was shot and posted the Facebook video of the aftermath, the officer asked Castile for his license and registration. As he reached for his wallet, he also told the officer that he had a concealed carry permit and a gun. Reynolds said the officer told him not to move, but as Castile tried to put his hands up, he was shot and killed. Sterling, meanwhile, was outside a store when police came. A gun was reportedly found in his pocket after he was shot and killed. The store's owner, Abdullah uh, Muflahi, who knew Sterling, said Sterling was not reaching for the gun, and videos don't show any evidence that he was. On social media, many are already asking why the Second Amendment did not protect Sterling and Castile. Uh, rights aren't self-enforcing, that's why. And why gun rights advocates like the National Rifle Association are not speaking out on their behalf. In each case, there are complicated legal questions and many of the details remain unclear, but it is true that gun rights groups like the NRA and its allies have typically pushed for laws that would allow citizens broader freedom to bear arms than currently permitted. It is also the case that the interpretation of the Second Amendment has for decades been deeply intertwined with the ways the law protects, and more often fails to protect, African Americans in comparison with whites, a history that begins in earnest in the 1860s, flares up in the 1960s, and is again relevant today. The Sterling case is the more complicated one. Sterling was a convicted felon, and thus probably not legally permitted to have a gun. While Louisiana allows open carry of fire handguns for anyone legally allowed to possess one, concealed carry requires a permit, does it? Really? In Louisiana? For which Sterling would have been ineligible. Sterling had allegedly been displaying the gun, which is the reason why the police were called. The crucial point is that the police couldn't have known when they arrived on the scene whether Sterling's gun was completely legal or not. An additional irony is that, according to Muflahi, Sterling had begun carrying the gun because he was concerned about his own safety. That is to say, for the very reason that gun rights advocates say citizens should be allowed to, and many argue, carry, uh, should carry guns. And by the way, they do in many places actually advocate, hey, uh, this prohibition against convicted felons carrying guns, convicted felons have to protect themselves too, you know, and maybe more often than the rest of us. That, that's on the agenda. The Castile case looks more straightforward based on what's known now. Assuming Castile's permit was valid... I think we can do that. He was placed in an impossible position by the officer. Unlike Sterling, who seemed to have been resisting arrest, a fact that in no way justifies an extrajudicial execution by the officers. I don't even know how resisting, how much resisting was going on there. Castile was attempting to comply with contradictory imperatives. First, the precautionary step of declaring the weapon to the officer. Second, the officer's request for his license and registration. And third, the officer's command to freeze. And that's asterisked. Where does that get resolved? I'm not even sure. Uh, the article, here it is, the article originally stated that Castile had a legal obligation to declare his weapon to the officer. In fact, in Minnesota, holders of concealed carry permits need only declare their weapons when asked to do so by an officer. We regret the error. Uh, thanks for that one. It's a good point because it brings up uh, the small bore changes that have been pushed for by gun rights advocates in state to state. You can't keep things straight anymore but yes uh piece by piece all of the reasonable restrictions that we learned about in the other article have been removed chipped away uh, not only just not only stand your ground which is the most famous of the changes in uh, gun and self-defense policy in general but also 
gun specific stuff like uh, Guns Everywhere Georgia's uh, new prohibitions against asking police asking you if you have a permit. It's illegal for you to have that gun without a permit, but it's also illegal for me to ask you whether you have a permit, which leads to ridiculous and contradictory and purposefully stupid uh, interaction between gun open carry protesters in some states and police, uh, which I keep looking to as illustrations of white privilege, which is also true. Uh, in which, you know, uh, I always look at those things in reaction to black people getting shot by police for being black versus white people who don't even have a gun drawn on them when they are all, are already uh, singled out by police because gun, and then they ask them for their ID. Mm, I don't think I'm going to show you. I don't have to. And they're very snide about it very often. Or uh, they try to, they try to uh, put on airs about being polite. No, sir, I don't think I'm going to show it to you. The law says I don't have to. But the snideness always comes through. It's very easy to detect. Back to the article. Some activists contend that white men in the same situations would never have been shot. Uh, it's not a question of never, but it's certainly... Uh, well, we'll say this. There's plenty of examples of white people doing the very same things and not getting shot. I mean, very same things. So for instance, there was the John Crawford situation, black man who had a, a, a BB gun in Walmart, famously gunned down for, uh, because people assumed it was a real weapon. And just, you know, barely weeks later, Two white guys did the same thing, unpacked BB guns in Walmart, but actually were running around the store shooting them, and uh, they managed to get away with their lives. Uh, and, of course, uh, right after the uh, Sterling, the shooting uh, in Baton Rouge, I, uh, it only took days to find the story of a white guy standing outside of a convenience store, actually waving a gun around and trying to teach local teenagers how to use the gun. And... Uh, He was captured without incident. Anyway, uh, it's an impossible counterfactual to prove, as they point out, although there's relevant circumstantial evidence, such as the fact that black men are much more likely to be shot by police than any other group. Raw story, they point out, rounds up stories of white people who pointed guns at police and were not shot. Castile's shooting is reminiscent of a 2014 incident in which South Carolina State Trooper Sean Grobert pulled a black driver over in Columbia. We all remember this one. Grubert asked the man, LeVar Edward Jones, for his license and registration, but when the driver turned to get them, Grubert uh, promptly shot him without warning. And he seems to have feared, however irrationally, for his safety when Jones reached into the car. But what was Jones supposed to do? He was complying with the officer's instructions. And he later, the officer, Grubert, uh, pled guilty to assault and battery. So there was at least that. South Carolina hasn't been the worst in terms of getting, uh, holding some of their officers accountable for their actions. The two shootings give a strong sense that the Second Amendment does not apply to black Americans in the same way it does to white Americans. Although liberals are loath to think of the right to bear arms as a civil right, it's spelled out in the Bill of Rights. Like other civil rights, the nation and courts have interpreted it differently over time as an individual right and as a collective right, but however it's been applied, African Americans have historically not enjoyed nearly the same protection as their white fellow citizens. As Adam Winkler wrote in The Atlantic in 2011, and we read yesterday and today, one crucial testing ground for a personal right to bear arms came in the aftermath of the Civil War. Blacks in the South encountered the new landscape, one which they were ostensibly f- in which they were ostensibly free but vulnerable and beset by white antagonists. We know what that was about. Uh, the idea of the Ku Klux Klan as a disarmament posse was discussed in our reading yesterday. In response, General Dan Sickles, who was in charge of Reconstruction in South Carolina, decreed blacks could own guns. State officials ignored him, so Congress passed a law stating that ex-slaves possessed the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings concerning personal liberty, including the constitutional right to bear arms. In the words of the Yale constitutional law scholar Akhil Reed Amar, between 1775 and 1866, the poster boy of arms morphed from the conquered Minuteman to the Carolina freedman. 
Black Americans, again, prominently asserted their right to bear arms during the 1960s. We have the example of Malcolm X. Uh, in fact, Malcolm was exercising his own right for uh, own a gun for self-defense, concerned that members of the Nation of Islam, with which he had recently or which he had recently deserted for Sunni orthodoxy, would try to kill him. His fear was, of course, vindicated the following year when nation members did murder him. Yowza. In 1967, Black Panthers began taking advantage of California laws that permitted open carry, walking the streets of Oakland armed to the teeth, citing threats of violence from white people and particularly white cops. When people were pulled over, Panthers would arrive on the scene to ensure justice was done, they argued, or to intimidate the cops, the cops contended. In response, we know about the Mulford Bill. The Panthers decided then to go to the state capitol to exercise their rights and protest. As theater, it was an incredible gesture. As politics, catastrophe. The sight of heavily armed black men brandishing rifles galvanized support for Mulford's bill, which promptly passed and was signed into law by Reagan and set off a spree of gun control laws that only began to be rolled back years later, leading to the current regime of permissive laws. The gun control laws of the late 1960s, designed to restrict the use of guns by urban black leftist radicals, fueled the rise of present-day gun rights movement, one that, in an ironic reversal, as we read, is predominantly white, rural, and politically conservative. Signs of that shift are visible around the nation now. In Texas, gun owners, largely white, staged an open carry rally on the Capitol grounds of Austin in January, an echo of the Panthers rally in Sacramento. Even some gun advocates looked askance at that move. Meanwhile, the Panthers' tactic of carrying guns and watching the police has an echo in the rapidly spreading practice of filming encounters with the police, just as happened in the Sterling and Castile shootings. And by the way, not just among the black community, but among the open carry uh, Tarrant County version of open carry Texas as well. They consider themselves equal parts open carry, equal parts cop watch. Black Americans may not enjoy the full protection of the Second Amendment, but technology has offered a sort of alternative, one that may be less effective in preventing brutality in the moment, but has produced an outpouring of outrage. One common thread through all these cases is the constant threat of state violence against black Americans from unreconstructed Southern officials, from California police, and today from police around the country. Gun advocates frequently argue that more guns and more people carrying guns produce a safer society, or at least a more polite one, right? This, and the contrary claim, that they undermine public safety, depend on statistics. But anecdotally, both Castile and Sterling represent cases in which carrying a gun not only failed to make men safer, but in fact contributed to their deaths. The NRA has not made a public statement on either case, and the spokesman did not immediately reply to a request for comment. In any case, the American approach to guns is, for the moment, stable, they say the courts and particularly the Supreme Court have inched toward a more um, toward much broader gun rights, including a suggestion of a personal right to bear arms. The death of Antonin Scalia may in the long term produce a more liberal court, but that will require reversing years of precedent. In the meantime, spates of mass shootings and slightly and a slight increase in violent crime. Is that even true? Have produced highly vocal calls for gun control, but there's little reason to expect those efforts to succeed. To date, they have almost universally failed. In fact, the last few years have brought even looser gun laws. Quick changes in gun laws, regardless of whether they're desirable, are a remote possibility. As a result, the most uh, relevant question right now is not whether gun laws should change, but whether existing gun laws apply equally to all Americans, and if not, why they don't. So, Another piece of our puzzle here. Uh, and there's still more. Um, I, let's see. Which should be uh, the next contribution to it? Let's try this one. And this is the one that Bjorn sent me. Uh, but before I even go in that direction, let me address Gideon's next comment, which is really a question. Do you think that politicians think that condemning police for bad policing is a third rail. Yes. Easy. I promise you that they do. Not everyone will shy away from it in every instance, but they do think so. And the only 
protection you've got in it. it the, the more prominent a politician you are, the easier it is to get away with. The more localized, the m- m- simpler it is to find yourself falling victim to it. That's anecdotal in part, but I think you'll find a lot of examples. Um, but we should say something about uh, Senator Tim Scott's rather interesting speech. It wasn't a brilliant speech, but it was just, it was well received and uh, opened a lot of eyes. And I think it ought to be filed among with, uh, along with the stories, for instance, from Matthew Lewis the other day saying, hey, uh, smartphones have really opened my eyes to the reality of these claims of disparate treatment by police uh, for blacks and whites that uh, have made it impossible to ignore. And I guess I I now admit to having believed that it had been overhyped and now believing that it had not. It's now you've proven your case to me. Uh, and Tim Scott made a, a very, uh, really a brave speech. But uh, then again, I mean, as far as the bravery goes, like what are you going to do with the guy's a senator, right? So he's got a little bit of immunity from that. But part of the speech was being a senator doesn't really do it. Because he has still got black skin. It was really amazing listening to some of the stories. First of all, one that he had said he had been stopped seven times in the course of a year while he was a federal official uh, for, you know, bogus traffic stops. Uh, the, you didn't signal. And But, the, you know, they, the first thing they see is black guy. Later on, they find out, oh, oh, senator. And they end up, That's that's where... He says he's gotten three different phone calls from three different chiefs of police over the years apologizing for the behavior of their officers because their officers just saw a black guy. But chief figures out, uh uh-oh, senator, and figures out that he has to do something about it. Even on Capitol Hill, it had happened to him where he's wearing the member's pin, which is supposed to identify him immediately as a senator. Uh, He was stopped by a Capitol Police officer, he said, who said, the pin I know, the face you I don't. Show me your ID. I don't know how how brusquely he put it, but I mean, show me your ID to a U.S. senator? <laughs> eh, it doesn't help you. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's absolutely a third rail. I know it happened to my own dad. It was a uh, local elected official. I've told this story on the air before. Local elected official uh, approached by a, uh, n- not a, an immediate neighbor, but someone in the neighborhood uh, black professional, an attorney uh, driving to his new house in our you know, pretty white neighborhood. And I mean, that was the problem, right? He was driving to his house in our white neighborhood, followed all the way home and into the driveway by the local police because he was driving a nice car because he's a professional and is proud of himself and the work he's done and the place he's a earned for himself in society, but actually hasn't because he has to give it all up because you can't drive a nice car into a nice neighborhood and be black without being tailed by the police. And Tim Scott told a very similar story. Uh, My story is this. He complains to my dad, who he knows professionally and as a neighbor, and who is uh, on the town council and so is the right place to take something like that. My dad says, oh my God, what the hell are you doing, cops? Cops say, are you anti-police? Is that what this is about? And he says, look, I just, I'm just saying this guy's been mistreated. Uh, well, he, we, he thought he matched the description of a suspect. Da, 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 and he's, well, you know, did he or, or did you just think he was black and driving a nice car into a nice neighborhood? And so you thought maybe he was going to rob the place. Oh, he just said he matched his description. Well, look, we all know sometimes, just like anybody, police, they lie sometimes to get out of tough situations, like anybody. You know how that is. What? Police lie. How dare you? And believe me, the rest of the... I mean, he lost re-election, basically, with the uh, police putting every effort they could into defeating him for re-election and endorsing, instead, somebody who basically had all the same, you know, or many of the same positions on things, but was willing to say, I love cops. They never lie. And so we back him. And, uh, you know, in a municipal election to which not a whole lot of people pay a great deal of attention, what gets through in the local paper is the cops, and everybody loves cops because protect and serve. Thank you for putting on the uniform. Uh, we love you. Uh, here's a discount at the Chevy dealer, just like the troops. Uh, 
you know, the cops endorse this guy and they hate that guy. Well, you know, I pay about this much attention to local elections. That's what it says in the headline. I'll go with him. Boom. Done. But in the meantime, of course, you know, uh, following my dad home, following my brothers in their cars and finding citations that they usually uh, use to harass black people driving in the wrong neighborhood instead, but instead on my dad and the family. So you bet it's a third rail. Uh, some people are willing to uh, depend on their prominence and other protections, and perhaps this particular, um, uh, the political atmosphere perhaps permits a little bit more. I mean, having seen the videos, now it's not just viewed as tall tales being told by complaining minorities. So there's a little bit more leeway for that. Anyway, let me go over to this piece that Bjorn shared with me. This is actually uh, also a current piece, published at Raw Story, originally from Alternet, written by Tom Hartman, who you can hear right here on Netroots Radio. Uh, in his regularly scheduled slot. The Second Amendment, he says, was ratified to preserve slavery. This one, I think, uh, as a historical theory, uh, on somewhat shakier ground, but still there are parts of it that ring true, but I think an important part of the, the history. Let's see if we can't share this one quickly. The real reason the Second Amendment, he says, was ratified, the Second Amendment ratified, and why it says state instead of country the framers knew the difference, see the Tenth Amendment, which is a garbage amendment, was to preserve the slave patrol militias in southern states, which was necessary to get Virginia's vote. Founders Patrick Henry, George Mason, and James Madison were totally clear on that, and we all should be too. Uh, maybe it's in writing, I don't know. In the beginning, there were the militias. In the South, they were also called the slave patrols, and they were regulated by the states. Uh, they may have been the same people anyway. In Georgia, for example, a generation before the American Revolution, laws were passed in 1755 and 1757 that required all plantation owners on their male white, em- or their might, whale, heh, whale might, male white employees, right, <sighs> to be members of the Georgia militia. And for those armed militia members to make monthly inspections of the quarters of all slaves in the state. The law defined which counties had which armed militias and even required armed militia members to keep a keen eye out for slaves who may be planning uprisings. As Dr. Carl T. Bogus, that's a terrible name if you're going to be cited in history, wrote for the University of California Law Review in 1998, the Georgia statutes required patrols under the direction of commissioned militia officers. See, there is a little bit of daylight there between the two to examine every plantation each month and authorize them to search, quote, all Negro houses for offensive weapons and ammunition, unquote, and to apprehend and give 20 lashes to any slave found outside plantation grounds. It's the answer to the question raised by the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio in Django Unchained when he asked, why don't they just rise up and kill the whites? If the movie were real, it would have been a purely rhetorical question because every Southerner of the era knew the simple answer. Well-regulated militias kept the slaves in chains. Sally E. Hayden, in her book Slave Patrols, Law and Violence in Virginia and the Carolinas, notes that although eligibility for the militia seemed all-encompassing, not every middle-aged white male Virginian or Carolinian became a slave patroller. There were exemptions, so men in critical professions like judges, legislators, and students or anybody who didn't want to do it, could stay at their work. Generally, though, she documents how most Southern men between the ages of 18 and 45, including physicians and ministers, had to serve on slave patrol in the militia at one time or another in their lives. I'll bet they could buy their way out of that. And slave rebellions were keeping the slave patrol busy. By the time the Constitution was ratified, hundreds of substantial slave uprisings had occurred across the South, Blacks outnumbered whites in large areas, and the state militias were used to both prevent and put down slave uprisings. As Dr. Bogus points out, slavery can only exist in the context of a police state, and the enforcement of that police state was the explicit job of the militias. If the anti-slavery folks in the North had figured out a way to disband or even move out of the state, those southern militias, the police state in the South would collapse. And similarly, if the North were to invite military service uh, into military service, the slaves of the South then they could be emancipated, 
which would collapse the institution of slavery and the Southern economic and social systems altogether. These two possibilities worried Southerners like James Monroe, George Ma- Mason, who owned over 300 slaves, and the Southern Christian evangelical Patrick Henry, who opposed slavery on principle but also opposed freeing slaves. A sellout, that <laughs> Patrick Henry. Anyway, uh, their main concern was that Article 1, Section 8 of the newly proposed Constitution, which gave the federal government the power to raise and supervise a militia, could also allow that federal militia to subsume their state militias and change them from slavery-enforcing institutions into something that could even one day free the slaves, like the Union Army. This was not an imagined threat. Famously, 12 years earlier, during the lead-up to the Revolutionary War, Lord Dunsmore offered freedom to slaves who could escape and join his forces. Liberty to slaves was stitched onto their jacket pocket flaps. During the war, British General Henry Clinton (laughs) extended the practice in 1799. I'm sorry, 1779, and numerous freed slaves served in General Washington's army. Thus, southern legislators and plantation owners lived not just in fear of their own rebel uh, slaves rebelling, but also in fear that their slaves would be emancipated through military service. At the ratifying convention in Virginia in 1788, Henry laid it out. Let me here call your attention to that part, Article 1, Section 8, which gives the Congress power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. By this, sir, you see that their control over our last and best defense is unlimited. If they neglect or refuse to discipline or arm our militia, they will be useless. The states can do neither, this power being exclusively given to Congress. The power of appointing officers over men not disciplined or armed is ridiculous, so that this pretended little remains of our power left to the uh, so that this pretended little remains of power left to the states may, at the pleasure of Congress, be rendered nugatory. Delicious, delicious nougat is so nugatory. Uh, George Mason expressed a similar fear. The militia may here be destroyed by that method which has been practiced in other parts of the world before, that is, by rendering them useless, by disarming them. Under various pretenses, Congress may neglect to provide for the arming and disciplining of the militia. Can you imagine Congress neglecting to provide for things? And the state governments cannot do it, for Congress has an exclusive right to arm them under this proposed Constitution. Henry then bluntly laid it out. If the country be invaded... A state may go to war, but cannot suppress slave insurrections under this new constitution. If there should happen an insurrection of slaves, the country cannot be said to be invaded. They cannot, therefore, suppress it without the interposition of Congress. Congress, and Congress only, under this new constitution, can call forth the militia. And why was that such a concern to Patrick Henry? In this state, he said, there are 236,000 blacks, and there are in many several other states, but there are few or none in the northern states. May Congress not say that every black man must fight? Did we not see a little of this in the last war? We were not so hard pushed as to make emancipation general, but acts of assembly passed that every slave who would go to the army should be free. Patrick Henry was also convinced that the power over the various state militias given the federal government in the new constitution could be used to strip the slave states of their slave patrol militias. He knew the majority attitude in the North opposed slavery, and he worried they'd use the constitution to free the South's slaves, a process they called manumission. The abolitionists would, he was certain, use that power, and ironically this is pretty much what Abraham Lincoln ended up doing, they will search that paper, the constitution, and see if they have power of manumission said Henry. And have they not, sir? Have they not power to provide for the general defense and welfare? (laughs) Boy, this is a broad interpretation of the Constitution. I love it. It's right. Uh, Anyway, may they not think that these calls for the abolition of slavery, may they not pronounce all slaves free, and will they not be warranted in that power? This is no ambiguous implication or logical deduction. The paper speaks to the point. They have the power in clear, unequivocal terms and will clearly and certainly exercise it. Woohoo! Thanks, Patrick. He added, This is a local matter, and I can see no propriety in subjecting it to Congress. James Madison, the father of the Constitution and a slaveholder himself, basically called Patrick Henry paranoid. I was struck with surprise, Madison said, when I heard him express himself 
uh, express himself alarmed with respect to the emancipation of slaves. There is no power to warrant it in that paper. If there be, I know it not. Well, okay. But the Southern fears wouldn't go away. Patrick Henry even argued that the Southerners', or Southerners property, that is slaves, would be lost under the new Constitution and the resulting slave uprising would be less than peaceful or tranquil. In this situation, Henry said to Madison, I see a great deal of property of the people of Virginia in jeopardy and their peace and tranquility gone. So Madison, who had, at Jefferson's insistence, already begun to prepare proposed amendments to the Constitution, changed his first draft of one that addressed the militia issue to make sure it was unambiguous that the southern states could maintain their slave patrol militias. His first draft, for what became the Second Amendment, had said, The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, but... Uh, no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. Hmm. But Henry, Mason, and others wanted southern states to preserve their slave patrol militias independent of the federal government, so Madison changed the word country to the word state and redrafted the Second Amendment in today's form. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Little did Madison realize that one day the future weapons manufacturing corporations, newly defined as persons by his Supreme Court, some have called dysfunctional, would use his slave patrol militia amendment to protect their right to manufacture and sell assault weapons used to murder schoolchildren. Well, that's a bit of a leap at the end there, but interesting background nonetheless. Thank you very much for sharing it with us, Bjorn. All the way, uh, we have to depend on the Norwegians to teach us our own history. So there's more. And it's about guns and police violence, and it's in the Atlantic. And this time, uh, it is, uh, let's see if we have this correct here. Uh, once again, let's see. Oh, it's, it's Tani C. Coates on this one. And so that's important. And so maybe that's even something that you ought to read for yourself just to really be able to digest it and also to give us some room to wrap up with a few other items. But let me take a quick look at this one. This one is called The Near Certainty of Anti-Police Violence. This is going to take us, one, back to the present day, and two, extrapolate out a little bit from the background we've learned, uh, which I think was an important predicate to the prediction he's making. By ignoring illegitimate policing, America has also failed to address the danger of this illegitimacy poses to those who must do the policing. Important points. Let's throw a few of them out there and uh, see if we're just compelled to continue. It would be hard to believe that uh, Coates would not leave us compelled to continue. Last month, the Obama administration accused Donald Trump, remember that guy, of undercutting American legitimacy in the eyes of the world. Trump's call to ban Muslims, which... uh, uh, Newt Gingrich has just joined, I guess, wasn't just morally wrong, according to Vice President Joe Biden. It called into question America's status as the greatest democracy in the history of the world. It's not making America great. President Obama followed Biden by asserting that Trump's rhetoric doesn't reflect our democratic ideals, saying it will make us less safe, fueling ISIL's notion that the West hates Muslims. His point was simple. Wanton discrimination in policy and rhetoric undercuts American legitimacy and fuels political extremism. Uh Uh-oh, that sounds broad. This lesson is not limited to Donald Trump, and it applies as well abroad as it does at home. Last week, again, 25-year-old Micah Xavier Johnson murdered five police officers in Dallas. This abhorrent act of political extremism cannot be divorced from American history, recent or old. In black communities, the police departments have only enjoyed a kind of quasi-legitimacy. That is because... Wanton discrimination is definitional to the black experience, and very often it is law enforcement which implements that discrimination with violence. A community consistently subjected to violent discrimination under the law will lose respect for it and act beyond it. When such actions stretch to mass murder, it is horrific, but it is also predictable. But of course, that only gives legitimacy to the white people's predictions of that violence and that they are the targets of it and it perpetuates the cycle in which they discriminate and carry guns to help them do that discrimination. You can see that this is not an easy thing to resolve and it won't be resolved here even if we finish the ta Coates piece, which 
I think we'll just give you a quick taste of it and recommend it to you as weekend reading for your uh, very important cocktail chatter, especially during this Netroots Nation weekend. Okay, so other things that uh, deserve some attention. Just going to throw these couple things out here so that you're aware of them when they become bigger stories this weekend. Trump news. The Chicago Tribune had this very interesting piece headlined, Why Won't Retailers Move Into Trump Tower? Here's something we missed. Republican donors may have shelled out a million dollars among them to eat lunch Tuesday with Donald Trump at Trump Tower in Chicago, but getting retailers to move in there has been harder. Seven years after the tower bearing the braggadocio's name was completed with postcard-worthy views, the presumptive Republican nominee has not managed to lease out even one of his huge riverfront retail spaces at Trump Tower. Amazing. But the agent in charge of leasing them out now says, "Eh, things are looking up. Maybe we should see something in late 2016 or early 2017 when all this election crap, I guess, is over. Anyway, uh, we'll just leave it at that. And uh, that way, when somebody brings up Trump, you'll be able to add that he sucks even in Chicago and uh, you'll look like you're on top of things. All right. Other interesting stuff. Let's see uh, more about the uh, circus of stars that Trump promised at his showbiz convention. But of course, one by one, they are insisting they were they never had any intention of joining him there. That written up in the Washington Post. Uh, Roger Ailes story. Of course, you've heard most of the stuff by now. But here's an interesting point. It's probably occurred to you already in light of the fact that we've been through this before with Bill Cosby, but in case it hasn't occurred to you yet, it ought to be made explicit. This a piece from the Chicago Reader. Roger Ailes' accuser Susan waited decades for someone to hear her out, written by Michael Miner, makes a very important point. When we speak of accusers coming out of the woodwork, uh, a phrase that has been used in this case, we speak with faint disparagement of opportunists getting in on the act. I mean, Bill O'Reilly, I think, has been explicit in saying that that's what was going on right now with the Ailes case. Bill Cosby's lawyer denounced the women lining up outside the gates of Cosby's Citadel as people coming out of the woodwork with fabricated or unsubstantiated stories. A Cosby defender, columnist Audrey Ignatoff of RenewAmerica.com, who the hell's that, commented, all of these women seem to come out of the woodwork. That's the phrase. Something about this just doesn't seem so random to me. Okay, that's the sort of thing that on, at first blush with people who make decisions about voting, uh, let's say, by, along these lines. Hey, Trump, he tells it like it is, right? That, that works with them. But if you're at all thoughtful, you've probably had this occur to you. Uh, okay, so now it's Roger Ailes, CEO and chairman of Fox News, who's in the line of fire, and the cliche is back in circulation. After being dismissed by Ailes as an afternoon host, former anchor Gretchen Carlson filed a suit earlier this month accusing uh, Ailes of sabotaging her career because she refused his sexual advances and complained about severe and pervasive sexual harassment. Politico's Kelsey Sutton then wrote that according to Carlson's attorneys... Since the suit was filed, at least 10 women had come out of the woodwork and contacted the firm about being harassed by the long-serving Fox News head. Robert Franklin at LiberalAmerica.org wrote that nearly a dozen other women came out of the woodwork, pointing their fingers at the conservative propagandists. Though I think this probably was just tin-eared writing on their part, readers had a right to wonder if one or the other was letting skeptical feelings be known. Ailes, 76, is one of television's oldest, fiercest lions. He closely identified with the relentless right-wing slant of his network, which he joined after serving George H.W. Bush as chief media strategist during the 1988 campaign. Carlson's suit is a big media story, and other journalists jumped on it. Some of the stories reflected on what the New York Times, in this linked piece, called changing mores in the workplace, Others aimed their sights directly at Ailes. New York Magazine interviewed some of the women who'd contacted Carlson's lawyer and last week posted six more women alleged that Roger Ailes sexually harassed them. One of these women women was, quote, Susan, not her real name. Susan said she'd encountered Ailes half a century ago when he was 26 years old and running a popular syndicated TV talk show in Philadelphia, the Mike Douglas show. 
Uh, basic story here, just to be able to get on to the main point here. She was 16 years old at the time. He called her modeling agency. They sent her in. He basically just whips it out, exposes himself, and says, uh, kiss them, which is also kind of familiar. She has a rather foul description of his genitalia, but uh, anyway, she refuses. She panics. She tries to run out of the room. She He chases her around the room, and then eventually he decides, all right, this clearly isn't going to work out. Get out of here. Don't tell anybody about this. I've got it all on tape, he says to her, which is amazing because that should go the other way. Anyway, the New York Times, the New York article rather, ended with the statement from Ailes's lawyer accusing Carlson and her lawyers of desperately attempting to litigate this in the press because they have no legal case to argue. The latest allegations, all 30 to 50 years old, are false. When I read this, I could hear in my head what went unspoken. The charges are ancient, the charges are false, these women all just came out of the woodwork. So, I write here to put something on the record. I know Susan, not her real name. And I've known her since we were both children. She did not just come out of the woodwork. She told me about her encounter with Roger Ailes decades ago. And, more to the point, she tried to tell the world, too. In 1988, she saw Ailes rise to national prominence. And four years later, when Bush ran for re-election, Susan expected more of the same from Ailes. Ultimately, he had no formal role in the 92 campaign, but Susan typed up an account of the Mike Douglas show encounter and sent it to the primary alternative newspaper in what was by then her hometown, L.A. Weekly. Roger, you made me a Democrat, she called her story and went on to say that pre ales she'd been a Goldwater girl and her mother a Republican committee woman. The story she submitted in 1992 was a more detailed version than the account she just gave to New York Magazine. But Jay Levin, the editor of LA Weekly at the time, remembers it and says he assigned a staff writer to call Ailes, expecting the usual, she's lying and I'll sue you. But instead, Curran, the reporter, said he got a kind of mumbling self-pity from Ailes. So I decided I needed to hear him myself. Ultimately, they said they couldn't find secondary corroboration for the story and they didn't run it. Likewise, Washington, D.C. papers couldn't find corroboration and wouldn't run it. When I read about Carlson suing Ailes, I sent Susan an email that said, isn't this your guy? Susan told me she'd already contacted Carlson's lawyers. Well, good for her. Accusers don't just pop out of the woodwork because they smell an opportunity. Sometimes the world is finally ready to hear what they have to say. That is pretty amazing. And uh, by the way, you should take a look at the piece. I will link it, of course, or I will give it to Scott to help me link it in the afternoon podcast post. There's a little bit I skipped there that actually gives the mechanical explanation for why the publication she contacted ultimately decided, and maybe even rightly, not to publish the story. It's just very interesting that when finally the world expresses a willingness to hear the story... Yeah, at that point, they come out of the woodwork because they find a path to justice. It's well worth thinking about. Of course, you'll be discussing it over the weekend and much more. Uh, No after show today, I don't think, but live programming once again from Netroots Nation. Do stop by if you happen to actually be there. Be heard. Talk to the people who run this thing. Thank them for doing it, as a matter of fact. And just meet some of the people behind the voices. Thanks for listening today and this week. Uh, thanks for listening as always, and remember that we are now on the the YouTube, as the kids like to say. I see a few of you picked up the chance to subscribe and help us boost our reach with that station as well. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. If you're in St. Louis or wherever you are, I'll talk to you next week. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to the K Grow in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. Thanks for listening once again. Uh, I can only wish you the greatest of uh, times at Origination. Tell me all the stories about the people you meet if you're there. If not, perhaps make plans to attend Nation 2017. Maybe that's something I ought to do when we find out where it is. See you next week.